So hi everyone. Um, uh, thank you for uh, the opportunity to speak uh, today. I will talk to you about uh, some of my PhD work, uh, which is done in collaboration with my supervisors, of course. So yet another uh, modified gravity map. <laughs> it's actually the same that uh, Kate already used, but uh, I think it's just great. I always use it in, in, in my talks. Uh, mm, what I want to uh, convey with this is that we have a whole landscape of gravity theories, right? GR is, uh, has a special role, but uh, we can, of course, generalize it and extend it in uh, many ways. And um, my goal is to try to build a unified framework, a unifying framework uh, for all these, um, or some of these at least, uh, modified gravity theories to try to understand uh, their relationship uh, to GR. Uh, so the way we do this is probably a little bit um, unconventional. So in general, we have this big picture of um, trying to explore generalizations of GR to try to understand GR as a special case in a broader framework, and maybe try to uh, overcome some limitations uh, of this theory in the, in the process. Um, but the, um, as I was saying, the way we do it uh, is uh, through, this, uh, through exploring this intriguing relationship between thermodynamics and gravity. Uh, maybe some of you know that it was um, sort of um, uh, brought to light in the 1970s in the context of black hole thermodynamics. And uh, it was put on a firmer footing by the work of uh, Jacobson in his um, thermodynamics of space-time approach. So basically what, what he was able to do is recover uh, the Einstein equations as an equation of state from purely thermodynamical considerations in an um, equilibrium thermodynamical setting. And he was able to generalize this um, this result for a modified gravity theory, metric f of r theory, um, uh, so recovering the field equations as an equation of state, but uh, provided that one switches to a non-equilibrium thermodynamical description. So there seems to be this uh, intriguing and poorly understood relationship between GR as a sort of thermodynamical equilibrium state and modified gravity as a non-equilibrium state. Of course, in this thermodynamics of gravitational theories. What I mean by this is that we're trying to uh, work in a sort of theory space, have a meta theory of theories um, where we have different theories of gravity and we try to understand if they can be related to one another in a, in a unified picture. Um, so two questions were left uh, open by this, uh, by this approach. Uh, first, how do we get from the non-equilibrium to equilibrium? So what kind of dissipative process would we try to um, a picture there, and also what's the order parameter, uh, so uh, the one that measures the closeness to uh, equilibrium, it would generally be the temperature in this thermodynamical analogy. Um, so this is what we've been trying to address. Um, the, the plan involves that we take uh, scalar tensor theory in a very generic um, uh, class, and then we um, we do something very simple. Basically, just uh, take the scalar contribution to the to the um, effective stress energy tensor, isolate all the contributions that have to do with uh, the scalar field, and then take this fluid seriously as a, as a fluid and apply um, an irreversible non-equilibrium thermodynamical description to it, uh, such as the one developed by Eckert. And this way, we can extract some thermodynamical quantities, such as the temperature and viscosity, and try to understand this dissipative process. Of course, we're not talking about a real fluid. Some with some micro microphysics uh, behind it, but just um, building up this analogy is something that was also done in um, uh, several different works. Um, so uh, this is the action that we're dealing with, brand scalar tensor action, Jordan frame, very, very generic. We simply write the effective Einstein equations and isolate all the terms that um, contain phi. And this uh, stress energy tensor has the form of an imperfect fluid, so it has uh, heat fluxes, it has anisotropic stress ten sensors, and, and so on. And the only assumption that we need for this to work is that uh, the gradient of our scalar field needs to be time-like and future-oriented, so we can have a natural fluid interpretation with a well-defined velocity, and so everything uh, makes sense. Uh, once we do this, we can apply this um, non-equilibrium th thermodynamical description to it, uh, which is um, uh, condensed in these three uh, constitutive equations. So these uh, equations basically relate some uh, dissipative quantities, such as the viscous pressure, the heat fluxes, and so on, to uh, kinematical and thermodynamical quantities. K, for example, is uh, the conductivity of the fluid and T is its temperature, which we're really interested in. Um, these uh, constitutive relations are the simplest linear, um, linear in the dissipative variables, uh, linear assumptions that satisfy um, the covariant form of the second law of thermodynamics, basically. And there are some relativistic generalizations of uh, well-known um, laws. 
what we can do from here is notice that um, we actually, uh, due to a sort of uh, proportionality, um, we can derive an expression for this kT, where k, again, is the conductivity of the fluid and t is uh, its temperature. Uh, this turns out to be uh, positive definite, which was not expected uh, a priori because it's just a formal analogy, but it's meaningful uh, for a temperature, of course. And we interpret this as a sort of temperature of scalar tensor gravity. What we mean is that um, it's basically a temperature relative to GR. GR represents the equilibrium state in this um, thermodynamical picture because in GR we have, of course, no phi fluid, we have no uh, additional scalar field, so um, this KT would go to zero. And so if this is the uh, GR limit, um, the GR case, anytime we have a KT that is greater than zero because we have an additional scalar degree of freedom, we would have a temperature that is greater um, than zero. Uh, another thing that we can do is try to um, understand the, um, the temporal evolution of this KT to see uh, this dissipative process that we've been um, talking about. So uh, what one gets is this effective heat equation, and one can study um, its fixed points because this would correspond to the other equilibrium states in this thermodynamical picture. So one of these uh, equilibrium states is, of course, GR. It seems to be special in all possible ways, but there could be other ones, and we want to understand if they're stable, if they're meaningful in any way. Um, so we found that uh, the cases corresponding to kT equal to zero are other theories where the scalar field is non-dynamical. And uh, in the case of kT equals con equal constant, um, we have found them that to correspond to scalar tensor stealth solutions. So solutions um, with the same geometry of that of GR, but have a non-trivial -sc non scalar field profile that does not uh, um, contribute to the stress energy tensor. Uh, in this whole picture, GR seems to be the only stable equilibrium according to various uh, criteria of stability that we studied. And uh, therefore, this is how we can sort of um, understand this mapping of, of the landscape. So this thermodynamical analogy uh, um, allows us to understand uh, GR's special role as the only stable equilibrium state at kT equals zero. And as I said, whenever we have an additional degree of freedom, scalar so far, but we've also trying to um, explore other um, sort of degrees of freedom, vector and so on, uh, we would have a kT that is greater than zero. There are also some pathological cases where, uh, that we studied where uh, for example, Nordstrom gravity is a pathological um, theory of gravity. Well, it just doesn't have the tensor field, but just the, the scalar field. And uh, this has less degree of freedom than GR, so it seems to confirm in our um, formalism that you would have a KT less than zero. Uh, but it, of course, doesn't make sense. It's just a, a proof of principle um, for us. So um, in this way, we can try to understand this dissipative uh, relaxation process um, to GR that happens in most cases, but it's not guaranteed. And uh, if you want an intuitive picture for this, we can try to understand this landscape of gravity theories with GR occupying a very central role and all the other um, states that would tend to it under some conditions and uh, no other equilibrium states so far um, at the, uh, equal to zero. There are several uh, developments that uh, this can lead to. I will mention just one. Uh, if we generalize this framework to Horndesky theories, that of course are uh, the most general uh, scalar tensor theories, um, we, uh, we find that this analogy only works uh, if for viable Horndesky theories. So only in the case where um, uh, the speed of gravitational waves is equal to C, which is interesting because it seems to, um, this analogy seems to point also in the direction of the physical um, constraints. And so I will leave you with a summary, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Okay, do we have any questions? Okay, well, I, I can start with one. So, so is the idea that, you know, in some way, you know, maybe our universe started in one of these non-equilibrium states with a modified gravity at higher energies, and then, you know, as the universe has evolved, somehow, we've sort of been forced just to pure GR because it's the only kind of equilibrium state? Um, so there are several ways of answering this question. Uh, so we're not trying to um, actually um, like predict what, what gravity is going to do, right? Mm. This is what observations are going to tell us. We're just trying to, be, to build a sort of theoretical framework. Mm. Um, but uh, we studied um, uh, this, um, um, all of this in a cosmological setting, and one finds that actually studying, for example, some exact solutions of scalar tensor theory, um, cosmological solutions, so you have, I don't know, expanding universe or whatever you have there, mm. and you find that uh, as the universe expands, gravity cools in the sense mm. that we, we end up uh, to the equilibrium state that is, um, that is GR. Uh, this also echoes another approach that was um, 
uh, done by, um, I think, Mark and Noe and, and some others, where in a different uh, context they were recovering something similar. And instead, uh, you, you could study also uh, the limit of um, singularities whenever you go to the initial singularity, for example, for very small um, t. Mm -hmm. And there you find that this temperature blows up. So it goes to infinity, and it seems to be uh, to mean that the, de the deviation from GR to um, other theories would be extreme and not not quantifiable mm. in any way. So, okay, that's very interesting. Oh, now we've got lots of questions. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, uh, we'll start with this one. Yeah, uh, thank you for your talk. Um, it's the first time that I'm hearing about this possibility of uh, obtaining G the GI equations as an equation of state. So. Um, I don't know if, if you have heard of uh, that, that there's something called information geometry, and if you know that if there's a connection in the sense of statistical mechanics and the GR part, and if that's related to, to that mm -hmm. uh, effect. Um, um, I probably haven't heard um, about exactly what you mean, but um, the point is that with this approach where you recover, um, uh, with Jacobson's approach, where you recover uh, GR's equation as an equation of state, you end up with something that, um, uh, you know, you end up with, a GR, uh, with gravity that is not a fundamental force, but something emergent. And there are several, um, like, emergent gravity approaches. Um, for example, by Padmanabhan or uh, other people, there is, uh, or you know, entropic gravity, for example. There are several of these models that try to understand the gravitational interaction as something that emerges from uh, maybe some quantum um, level uh, at, at, as the substructure, and then um, have sort of emergent uh, approaches, uh, sort of emergent effects such as geometry or something like that. So it's a very active um, field that I think okay. is related to to what okay, you're saying. Good, thanks. Okay, I think we'll have just one more question and then, um, yeah, so just this question here and then we'll uh, have to go for coffee, otherwise we won't have a coffee break. How does one test uh, uh, this scenario in which gravity emerges as a dissipative process? Sorry, I didn't How hear. does one test mm -hmm. the scenario in which gravity emerges as a dissipative process at the end state of some dissipative process, which is what you're proposing? Um, it's mostly a, um, a matter of studying several cases. Um, for example, with the, within this approach, one can study either entire classes of theories, like Orndesky or something else, or uh, study exact solutions uh, within these different theories. And then if you um, apply this, if you find this effective heat equation, then you can understand what the evolution is, and if KT goes to zero, then you would recover GR. But it's a matter of studying specific cases. We don't have like a, uh, an overarching theorem that says in every case you recover GR always. Okay, but if I was to take this seriously, is, it, is there a physical manifestation of this phenomenon in an observable in principle? Mm -hmm. uh, that it's something explode. similar to what Katie asked. So here we're moving in a sort of um, theory space, so we're not like predicting phenomenologically what would happen. This is, um, you know, uh, something for the observations. And, but it's just a way of, <clears throat> of understanding the relationship between the two theories. So no, you wouldn't have uh, an observational uh, consequence for that. Okay, I think we better stop there, but thanks to Serena again. Very good talk. Thank you.